Okay, so pleated pants or like pleated trousers. Um, admittedly, they took me a little bit of time to actually get used to and to kind of get into the get into the rhythm of. You know, like a couple of years ago, people were like, "Oh yeah, like pleated trousers are coming back." And you know, whenever someone says that, it always kind of just there's a lack of genuineness to someone saying like, "Yes, this is in fashion now." But anyways, I do actually think that pleated pants are cool and they have their their place, whether you like them or not. Um, they're kind of here to stay and they're going to be something that, you know, comes in and out of fashion pretty much from, from here until eternity. You know, as long as we have pants, we'll have different ways to design them. The more that I got into pattern making and pattern designing, the more I kind of learned to appreciate pleated trousers. You see, like, hips have curves to them, you know, you have a shape and it starts at the widest point of your hips and it kind of comes upwards and that's where you get into the waistband. And normally you'd have a very shallow curve to accommodate for that on trousers that don't have pleats. But on a pleated trouser, you actually have the opportunity for something that looks a little bit more interesting, a little bit more unique in my opinion. So here is the pattern that I used for the back panel of my trousers. Now I created this before for a different pair of pleated trousers, so I don't have the full creation here. Uh, but what's interesting is that there's the, like, that's the back seat area, but the side is entirely flat, entirely straight. That was a kind of intentional design on my end. I really wanted, and I kind of really like, really straight, flat um, pieces that are kind of easy to design, easy to, uh, easy to assemble, but in their kind of design, they really bring something unique to the table. So the curve that comes into the waistband is actually just the folds, the pleats um, coming together and creating that shape, creating that curve. And the advantage you now have is normally on non-pleated trousers, the curve, you know, it hugs your hips to a certain degree. You know, you need a little bit of looseness to move around, but for all intents and purposes, you're kind of limited, you're stuck. For a pleated trouser, the pleats draw the material in but when you move, the pleats will open up. You kind of get this more open feeling to it. And everyone always thinks that like pleated pants are really big, really baggy. It doesn't have to be the case. You will have extra material, of course, because the pleats make things more voluminous. They add space to the hips. And the trousers aren't under stress. They actually lay really flat. And that extra material is kind of folding in over itself. So the silhouette can still be slim, tapered, roomy as well. You have the option. To, to kind of go for either way. So I think the argument that pleats are only for baggy pants, I, I think is old. I still don't really like a huge, huge silhouette. I'm a, I'm a slim guy. So for me, it's always been better to have pants that fit. They feel kind of intentional on my body. They don't really look something, you know, way too old school. I wanted something that looked good on me, but still had that kind of intent behind it because that way it looks like I'm wearing this for a reason. The design was intentional. The pleats are here for me because I chose them to be here. So I also really like the idea of something that you age over time, something that you kind of take with you and make your own. I think the concept of raw denim for me is really, really appealing. So like raw denim and suiting, they don't really pair together super often. We're seeing more like, you know, denim dress shirts and such with suits more casually. And I think that's really cool. That's definitely up my alley. Uh, but like, you know, the idea of jeans and a, and a suit jacket or a sport jacket, uh, to me, I don't know, It's it's been always kind of mixed. I think if you're wearing like really dark skinny jeans and a blazer, it almost looks kind of like, yeah, I'm 19 and I know how to dress. You know, <laughs> the feeling's not really, it's not really where I want to be. So what I decided to do was take something that was a little bit um, more different. Take the angle of more traditional styled trousers. So I think pleats in that sense, I think really work. So what I did was I took some denim, some raw denim, uh, but it started off a little bit of a lighter wash. It's right here, it's a little bit more teal. Um, I know on camera here it looks pretty normal, but if I hold it next to this indigo denim that I'm gonna be using for another project in the future, you can really see the difference in the wash. Because I really wanted to avoid that look of like super dark jeans with a sport jacket. I definitely wanted to stay clear of like, you know, acid wash jeans head to toe, but I thought the, the teal kind of provided that nice mid-ground and made something for a little bit more interest. Now, to make it more kind of, we'll say suiting appropriate, I don't know if that's like the best term, but to make it more ready for a, for a more dressed up style, 
I took the Gurkha style of trousers. So Gurkha trousers are a large waistband, um, no belt loops, no belts intended, and the long waistband actually kind of crosses over into itself and buckles on the side. So it comes from military use as pretty much all suiting <laughs> kind of does. And to me, I really like the style. I think it's really interesting, it's really unique, and traditionally, they're pleated. So for me, I get something that is very obviously intended to be not jeans. I wanted these to kind of have as few visible traditional jeans details, so that they were basically just a pair of dress pants, but made out of denim. But then I decided, you know, I want, I really like raw denim. I love the history, I've loved it for so many years, that I want as many details as possible that really fit with that raw denim style, but hidden. You know, you don't want, like, again, I'm not, I'm trying to avoid that dark skinny jeans with, you know, a sport jacket look. So what I did was I took a couple of things, a couple details, and I made them all internal. I made them things that you don't actually see from the outside. And for the most part, that's really just for me. You know, it makes me feel a little happier to have these details. It makes it feel a little bit more unique. So the thing that I really wanted to work into the pants was the chain stitch. Now, if you talk to any like denim head, any raw denim enthusiast, they're likely obsessed with the chain stitch. You basically need, by definition, a chain stitch hem on a pair of raw denim. Like it is just, it's the requirement. A chain stitch is basically a series of knots um, underneath the fabric. So from the top, it looks like your normal straight stitch, but underneath you have these series of loops. I think it's really cool. I think it's really unique. The reason that raw denim enthusiasts love it is that it kind of twists the fabric in a way and that creates more interesting fades. So traditionally on raw denim, you will have a chain stitch hem and if possible, the inseam and outseam will also be chain stitched. Sometimes you'll have this chain stitch running down the inside of the leg, running down the inseam, and I think that creates a very interesting look. Now I've actually seen that kind of interior stitch, that running down the leg stitch, done um, on dress pants as well, actually. So for me, it was a detail that I felt I could really make use of, kind of really maximize for this purpose. But for all intents and purposes, I wanted them to be like a quality style dress pants, something that you know you would have to take another look at to be like, wait a minute, that's denim. And if you look at a lot of jeans, a lot of the time they have very heavy contrast stitching. Now that wasn't something that I was going to do here because that would again make it look too casual, it wasn't really the look that I was going for. So what I did was I used an orange stitch. Traditionally you'll see like yellow and kind of gold colored stitches on jeans. Um, I wanted that kind of essence to it, but instead what I did was the interior stitching was a chain stitch and it was orange. And from the outside, you don't see any of it. You only see the orange when you move, when the kind of the panels start to pull apart and then the orange stitching that holds them together becomes visible to the outside. But otherwise, none of the top stitching is orange, none of the visible details are orange. Uh, the only other details visible from the outside that were orange was that the buttonhole twists, so not the actual thread of the buttonhole, but just the kind of the interior thread that runs up and down it. Um, had orange mixed in. It was half navy, half orange. And then I taped the entire interior of the trousers with orange ribbon. I actually just kind of had this left over, uh, but when I saw it here uh, with the teal, I, th I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was a great combination, and I thought it made for a more dressed up look. Again, jeans inspired, but very much dress pants was what I was going for. So I already created the pattern, and again, these sides were entirely straight, and the shape would come from the pleats. But what I needed to do was create a pattern for the waistband, a pattern for the, the, the Gurkha waistband. So I took a pair that I had already, but for the most part, I just traced out the pattern and I wanted it to be, again, something that's more denim inspired. So I took the pattern and I only really took like the kind of broad strokes. I just needed the rough height, the rough width, where the buttonholes would be located. And then from the rest of it, I just created my own shape. I needed something to match with the buckles that I had, and I needed something to match with the style that I was going for. When I again wanted to kind of create that more denim inspired look, but subtly, uh, I did a denim style waistband. Jeans are often made with a single piece waistband. So there's no split in the middle of the back. And if you look at the top, it's just kind of folded over. But 
on a lot of more traditional dress pants is actually that entire piece would actually be done in four parts. The interior material is actually probably like a liner. It's probably like a white cotton of some kind with only the exterior being done in two pieces by the actual front facing fabric. A lot of that is done with split in the back so that you can take the pants in or out. But because I was making these for myself and they have that adjustability on the side anyways, I didn't think that was necessary. So I made a one piece waistband to kind of echo the traditional styles of jeans without looking you know, weird or out of place. So at the bottom, we still have the chain stitch hem. And if you look inside, it looks just like a jeans hem. That was very much what I wanted to do. That was the hill that I was willing to die on. When you make a pair of pleated trousers, you also have the option to choose the direction the pleats go in. Uh, traditionally speaking, and I've used the word traditional a lot, but like it's worth noting, tra tradition doesn't really mean anything. You know, like what we call traditional was at some point controversial. So I chose to make the pleats inverted, basically facing inwards. That is the opposite of the way it would be done, you know, traditionally. But to me, that makes them more interesting. To me, it says that the pleats are here for a reason. I've seen a lot of more modern, recently released pleated pants that have that kind of style. The pleats go inverted. If you actually look very closely uh, at Peaky Blinders, the pleats are inverted on all of their trousers too. A lot of them double pleated. The Gurkhas are also very high-waisted, and that is a style that I personally lean towards. I like that a lot more actually just kind of out of comfort. Low-rise pants, they make everything so kind of tight and restrictive. I didn't want that. Um, but I thought that the really wide waistband, it's, it's so tall on the Gurkhas, makes it actually look a little bit more natural. It almost looks more like a sash than it does like an actual waistband because it's so thick and it wraps around your midsection. These things ended up actually sitting right below my belly button. And for me, that was good. That was exactly where I wanted them to be. I think it you know, brings a very unique look to the table. That kind of wide waistband sitting at the thinnest point of the body, I think personally is very flattering. You know, it brings out the hips a little bit, but it comes down into a more traditional taper. And that's kind of the style that I'm going for. Okay, so to make the really tall waistband trousers, we're gonna start by tracing our pattern onto some beautiful teal denim. Doing the same thing with the waistband pattern as well, making sure that the front and back panels are aligned with the sides, so that way we get a reference for how straight we want the side to be. I also made a pattern for the fly and the pocket. So we start by stitching the inseam first, and this is so that we can do that top stitch that we mentioned earlier. Now, I got this really nifty hand-turned vintage sewing machine. This thing's like 100 years old, and it does a chain stitch, which I think is really cool. Now, chain stitch machines are actually really expensive. The modern ones use three threads, this one just uses one, which actually I think is really interesting. But here we try and get an underside view. It falls because of course it does. I couldn't get that perfect shot properly, so I do apologize for that. Then we're surging the sides. The serger basically just like wraps the ends around with extra threads so that they don't fray too, too much. Most of the time you don't have to worry about it too much, but denim does have a tendency to fray a lot. Now to do the top stitch, we're rolling the extra in underneath the tiny arm on a wider machine. This wouldn't really be too much of an issue, but here we need to make it fit. Now that we have that top stitch done that goes down the inseam, we take these little flaps for the pocket, as well as some pocket bags that I made from an old shirt. We're pinning the whole thing together, and you'll notice that I'm doing this carefully, and that's because I constructed the back to be taller than the front. This gives some extra room to the seat, essentially making it a little bit rounder. This isn't necessarily normal. This is something I did on my own. Because I make my own patterns, it's hard for me to say what is considered industry standard, but I like to make patterns that seem more interesting or that seem more intentional. Now that we have the pocket in place, we're stitching the outseam, folding it over so that we can have the opening for the pocket. This creates a slant pocket. Then we're using the machine to stitch pockets together, stitching over once and then flat so that we have a nice smooth entry into the pocket. Once the pocket is finished, we can start stitching the seat. This was actually pretty difficult in the small machine, I'll admit, and there are parts that I cut out purely because the initial curve I made to the seat was wrong. Then we can stitch together the pocket flap. We're stitching it inside out first so that we can turn it inside in. 
Then we're doing the same thing for the fly as well. This was one that I created earlier for another pair of pants, so I don't have the creation for this, unfortunately. Most of these patterns were ones that I had made before, except for the Gurkha waistband. Then by hand, we're doing a top stitch on the pocket. I kind of decided that all of the visible stitching would be either a chain stitch or a hand stitch. So the pocket I did by hand. Now for the buttonhole on the pocket, this we're doing by hand as well. The machines are very expensive and hand stitch buttonholes, if they're done well, are absolutely beautiful. We're first making a hole, we're widening this with an awl, and then something wider. I don't really know what it is, I found it in a toolbox, and it's kind of like an awl, but less pointy. So we use that to widen the hole, and then we do an overcast stitch. This is kind of like doing a serge by hand. You essentially just wrap some thread around the open cut of the buttonhole, and in this instance, I decided to use orange thread because I wanted it to be a little more contrasted. I wanted it to be more interesting. Again, kind of echoing that, that idea of the subtle orange details. Then with the buttonhole twist, we're laying that across the buttonhole, the cut that we had made, taking a double strand of cotton thread, puncturing it roughly half a centimeter out from the cut of the buttonhole and wrapping the thread around the needle, first under the bottom and then over the top. This will do a similar casting stitch. And if you do it well, we'll have a series of small, tight, close together knots. And this will prevent the fabric from fraying and help it stand against the pressure of the button pulling against it. That's what the little hole at the edge is for. It creates that keyhole shape. And because we have the buttonhole twist running along the center, we have the little pops of orange and the orange overcast stands out a little bit. Personally, I love the look of this. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Honestly, let's just end the video now. We've peaked. Close the channel, we're done. <laughs> but realistically, I do think it's absolutely beautiful. A hand on buttonhole is the nicest thing, the nicest detail that you can add to something if you're capable of doing it. Now that we have the flap ready, we're going to make the back pocket. I chose to do just one flap on the right side. You could do as many flaps as you want. You could do as many pockets as you want. This is just the kind of style that I wanted to go for. Also, I just really didn't want to do another flap. So we take a rectangular piece of denim and we affix it to the outside of the back. You line up the center of the flap. You want the exact width of the pocket to be identical to the flap. And we'll make two vertical slashes on each side of the pocket. Then we stitch the outside of the box with a machine. I used a white thread for this because it would match the inside of the denim, the weft. That way it looked more natural if some of the threads got exposed. Once we have the box finished, we take a stitch ripper. It's a small little tool thing and you can just use it to make little cuts in the denim. I use it to just start the cut and then to finish it off, I use a pair of scissors. We make the little triangles at the end and this is for folding in the flap, which we do now. Honestly, I struggled a little bit to get this on camera because it's a very intricate process. So I do apologize for that as well. Once we have it folded in, we should have two welts that fold near the center, and we stitch over that over the triangles. This gives us a double welt pocket with no visible stitching. We stitch down the bottom first with the pocket bag faced up so we don't stitch the whole thing closed, and then finish it off at the top. The stitching is done right next to the welt pocket so that you can't see it. It should be entirely invisible if you do it right. I did use a pocket bag that I actually got from an old pair of raw denim that my friend had given me. Then we stitched down the fly. This is a little bit wider because I'm going to have a button fly, which again is a little bit more similar to how it's traditionally done with jeans. And then we take a similar rectangle, just like we did with the back pocket, and have it on the front. We have just a single one here, but I did make my own with four other hand done buttonholes as well. The hand done buttonholes were done with. Uh, a different buttonhole twist, just some white linen thread. I was worried that I'd run out, but now that I have so much extra, it's not really necessary. Then, just like the pocket flap, we are hand stitching the fly together. We want to make that, you know, traditional curved front that we see on jeans and, and pretty much every other pair of pants you've ever seen, which affixes the flaps in place and keeps them closed. I'm doing the same thing on the pockets as well. This isn't strictly speaking necessary, but it keeps the angle of the pockets consistent. And then just sew on some buttons and you'll be good to go. Then we're trimming the extra material. I had a lot of extra around the seat because I cut it completely straight and I make sure it fits first before cutting off the extra. And then we're taking the orange ribbon. I did initially try and attach this by machine. It was really difficult though because the ribbon was made of polyester so it kept sliding around and it was difficult to keep in place. I decided to just do it by hand, just watch some TV, get the hand stitching done. Then we're setting up the pleats. 
Again, these are inverted, but for the most part, you just have to control the location. I want them even on each side because of course you do. And then the only difference is the way that you fix them, the way that you hold them down. For the back, I decided not to do darts. I did more pleats, but they're much smaller. And then we just throw them on, give it a quick test, make sure everything fits properly. If we need to take it in further, we can either take in any of the seams or deepen the pleats. And here at the back, I decided to take in the center seam a little bit more, make the seat a little bit flatter and smoother. They were stitching the waistband together. This was actually pretty easy because it's just a single piece that I folded in half and you just have to stitch along the lines. I made the ends with little diamonds, but you can, if you do this yourself, you can make them whatever shape you want. The difficult thing about this waistband, and whether you do it in multiple pieces or not, this is probably where you're going to encounter some difficulty, is you now have to fold it inside in. This was really difficult. I spent forever doing this. I shoved pens and other things in there. I would kind of shove my fingers in the end like a Chinese finger trap. At the end, I was really, really close and I struggled to get the pen through it. So I just shoved my fingers in the end and kind of just, I just pulled it out like millimeter by millimeter. It's kind of a painful process, honestly, but you know, eventually you get there. And eventually we finally got it. It's, again, a bit of a painful process, but I'm just happy that it's over with. And then we get to the point where we have to attach the waistband. So I stitched down the outside first. To stitch the inside of the waistband down, we're actually stitching it from the outside, with basically doing the same thing we did with the back pocket. Stitching really close to the waistband and having a top stitch that blends right into the seam. Then we have to do the slit for the other end of the Gurkha waistband to pass through. I made a vertical line that matched the orientation of the pleat so that way everything looked straight and everything looked proper. We're doing exactly the same thing that we did with the previous buttonhole. This time I also did some overcast on the outside and that's just to make sure the two pieces of the fabric didn't shift. And then we're good to go. No awl or other sharp pointy implements needed because this is not a keyhole buttonhole. This is just a slit for the waistband to pass through. And then this is just decorative, but I also did some tacks on the outside of the pleats. This just, in my opinion, makes it look a little bit more complete. We basically just do some loops on the outside and then do a series of knots around it. It's already stitched in place, so we don't really need to. This is just more for decoration than anything. Then we have to make the little flaps that the buckles will be held into. So they're basically just long rectangles. And then instead of a buttonhole, we're going to make an eyelet. So we do the same process, we just widen a large hole, but we don't have to cut anything else. We just stitch around the large hole in the same way that we stitched a buttonhole, and then the clasp of the buckle can sit through the eyelet. I put it on backwards in this shot, I apologize, the actual flap goes underneath. And then I attached it by hand, but this was because I didn't want any visible top stitching that was done by machine. Then we do all the eyelets on the waistband as well. So I marked these ahead of time, they were actually in the pattern as well. I did the overcasting and navy thread this time. I wanted to make sure I still had enough orange thread left for the hem. I could have purchased more, and by the end I realized that I did actually have enough orange thread, but I just wanted to be careful. Once the overcasting is finished, I'm doing another push with the screwdriver thingy just to make sure that it's wide enough before we finish off the eyelid. This again is the exact same process as the buttonhole. We're still using the buttonhole twist, going around the outside in a circle, and making that series of knots. We wanna make sure they're tight, and this time we want to orient the knots more vertically, whereas the buttonhole they were faced more inwards. Just giving a quick test to make sure that it looks good when it is attached to the buckle. And that's beautiful. You can't go wrong. And then at the bottom, I'm doing a cuff. I decided to do this because it was the most similar way to a jeans cuff that I could get away with on a pair of, you know, more dressy trousers. And I didn't want it to have the traditional jeans cuff, but I also left a little extra so I could still do a jeans hem underneath. So I'm doing the hem with the little machine. This was actually really difficult and it wouldn't go over the thicker parts of the denim because there were so many parts folded over each other and this machine's like 100 years old. I'm not breaking it the first time I used it. Parts of the machine couldn't catch, I just finished by hand. You can actually do a chain stitch by hand pretty easily and honestly it's kind of fun but it's not on camera because it was also really hard. And then we're just securing it in place with the machine. I just finished the rest by hand, and then we're finally done, and I'm very happy with the end product. Honestly, I started making my own clothes and patterns for fun. I think this looks good with almost anything, but I'm not here to throw any sort of outfit together because I want to explain why it works. 
I think people can take things too seriously these days. I think anything can work because you want it to work. And fashion and clothing is something that you should enjoy because it's fun. You know, you shouldn't be taking everything so seriously. I think as clothing becomes more casual, we have the opportunity to bring more unique pieces to the front. And that's just what I want to do. I want to make fashion fun again. I want to have conversations not around why things work, but just how fun it is to make things. I think we could all do with a little bit more of that. Look at, look at, look at the deal. Look at it, look at it. It's so cool. Texture. <laughs>